On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Tom Marino. At Cone Resnick, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, Berkeley College, the law firm of Gibbons PC, United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on earth, Wells Fargo, Verizon Communications, and by New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Do you love me? Do you love me, baby? Do you love me? Yeah. Oh, now that I, I'm dancing, baby. That's some great stuff from uh, Motown the Musical and the gentleman you're about to see on camera is all about it. He is uh, Brandon Victor Dixon. He plays uh, Barry Gordy. Yes, sir. Who is all about uh, Motown. Um, first of all, welcome to our Thank studio. You. Happy to be here. Uh, playing Barry Gordy. What is that like? Um, well, considering that he wrote and produced the show and is involved in every creative aspect, it's a pain in my behind. <laughs> we, should let, we should let folks know that uh, Barry Gordy um, was Motown. Well, everyone connected to Motown was Motown. There would not have been a Motown if it were not for Barry Gordy. No, I mean, he's, he's the founder. And really, I mean, Barry, he was very fortunate, the artist he was able to find and come in contact with. But Barry taught them how to become the stars that, that they really became. And I was actually, I was just at an event with him and Smokey on Tuesday, and Smokey really, Smokey spoke to that fact. You know, mm -hmm. he just said, without Barry Gordy, there would be no Smokey Robinson, there would be no Temptations, there would be no Michael Jackson. Diana Ross? No Stevie Wonder, no Diana Ross, no, you know. And that's Barry, saying a lot. That's saying a great deal. He's really, um, really the, the greatest uh, music visionary in, in the history of the business. How'd they find you? Why, they, they looked at you. Somebody looked at you, some group of people looked at you and said, he's going to play Barry Gordy. Well, which is amazing when you think about it, because they're looking at a lot of people. Well, you know, Why actually, you? the way it came about is uh, our director, Charles Randolph Wright, is a uh, long been a mentor of mine. And he literally, he called me, he called me one day and he said, you'll never guess whose house I'm walking out of right now. I land in New York tomorrow, meet me at Chipotle at 7. <laughs> and we got in there, and he said, you know, I just left Barry Gordy's house. I'm going to be doing his show on Broadway, and I want you to be my Barry Gordy. And we just need to get together and figure out how to help him tell his story best on stage. Because as accomplished as Barry is, you know, live theater is a very different medium. And, uh, and really, he, he trusted Charles and, and my expertise in helping him do that. He really understands that... There, he knows a lot of things, but he doesn't know everything. And Barry, even at his age, with all he's done, he's eager to learn more and absorb more and figure out how to do things better. And so they really just brought us in to, to help him create his vision. What had you been doing up to that point? Up to that point, I mean, I've been working in theater uh, for many years. I uh, originated uh, a company of The Lion King as Simba. I was nominated for a Tony in The Color Purple, mm. Oprah Winfrey's The Color Purple. 
um, the Scottsboro Boys, Kander and Ebb's final piece together. I, I did that with them as well. Um, and I'd also worked with our other producer, because our show's produced by Barry Gordy, Kevin McCollum, who produced Rent and Avenue right. Q uh, in the Heights, and Doug Morris, who's the, the chairman and CEO of Sony Music. So Kevin also had me in Rent for a time as well. So I've been really just working in, in, in theater and, and shooting some television and doing concerts around, around the country. And, uh, and then Charles called me and said, let's, let's go meet the man himself. So, I, you know, for those of us who are um, R&B fans and more specifically Motown fans, mm -hmm. we think about Barry Gordon, we think about these extraordinary uh, performers. And, and when you watch um, some of the documentary footage, much of which is on, on PBS, and, and, and you can learn an awful lot about um, Motown through watching some of the documentary footage, a lot of it talks about Barry Gordy and the control as a leader and a manager that he had mm. over these acts. Yes. And how precise and specific, the, the quality control, if you will, exactly. that he um, made sure was always in place. Is it over-exaggerated from your interaction with him and everyone else trying to find out about this? Was he in that much control? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it... And we, we experience it on, on our show as well. Uh, now, when, when people say control, I mean, I, I think they, they get kind of like a, a, a menacing image of it. No detail too small. Yeah, no detail too small at all. And, and really, we built Motown the Musical in the same way that he built his company. I mean, there was quality control. Now, he gathered the, you know, the most intelligent people he could find in the medium, but really, then it was like, OK, well, best idea wins. And he has an idea of what he thinks is the right thing. And if you think you have a better idea, he says, OK, well, don't tell me, show me. And if you're right, then you're right. Mm -hmm. He's like, but I believe my idea will be better than yours, but show me. Um, and that's really how we proceeded. And he, it was a real collaborative effort. But yes, Barry was part of every single aspect of every detail of that show, the look, the feel. And even after we've opened, mm. Barry still says, you know, he comes back and he watches the show and he's like, you know, that they're not really getting some of the little things that I put into this scene. So we're going to make an adjustment here. We, he wants to con continue to refine. He's, does, he, does he critique you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, he lets you know. Yeah, he lets me know if there are things that he wants to come across differently or better. He lets me know. And sometimes, sometimes I disagree with him, and we'll have that argument, but it's OK. But you know, the other thing about Barry Gordy that those of us who try to know about this stuff uh, hear, I mm -hmm. think, is that he was a complex character like most great geniuses, right? Um, Diana Ross. Mm -hmm. They had a fascinating relationship, yes. complex relationship. We're about to see a scene between um, you playing Barry Gordy, and who plays? Uh, the, the wonderful Valicia LeKay. She plays Diana Ross. Special? She's beyond special. She's tremendous. Let's take a look. Please. From Motown, the musical. How great. Yeah, she's, I, she's spectacular. I love her so much. Chemistry, immediately? Uh, yeah, actually. You know, we, we met uh, a few weeks after I got the job. We met because we were doing a reading. And, uh, you know, when you know you're going to share a relationship like that on stage, mm. really the goal is to try and get to know each other. And, uh, and we began to talk, and we, we d really did connect uh, more quickly than I think I've connected with any other co-star I've worked with. And, uh, and that relationship has only deepened over time. And Barry Gordy and, and Diana Ross clearly connected um, on a lot of levels. So my question is this. How honest, how candid, how raw um, was Barry Gordy in sharing the good, the bad, and, and, and the sometimes ugly? Very, very honest. Now, I will say it, it was a process. I mean, so we've been working on the show for about three years. 
And I would say from, you know, the, my first time of meeting Barry here in New York, and then to traveling to L.A. and spending time with him at the house and really delving into the script and trying to figure out... Because, you know, we had a script, but when Charles and I were getting into it, and particularly me as an actor, looking for pieces of the character and what it is, it's really about digging through and trying to figure out, well, well, what do you mean here? I know you wrote this scene because this is what happened between you two, but what's the context of it? What was going on at the time mm -hmm. in your relationship? You know, what had... Did you know that... Um, that she was off seeing somebody else at this time, or did she know you were seeing? You know, it's like oh my really God. to get the details of what the relationship sort of is. Oh yes, it definitely, definitely evolved because putting a, uh, putting your life out on stage like that is it's it's a difficult process, particularly when you're someone who's done so much and touched as many lives as Barry Gordy. So, and he's very protective of the artists that he that he created that he that he has this relationship with. So really, in, in creating a piece of theater, you want to be as honest as possible, particularly in your exploration of it. And so it was a process for him, really sharing, not necessarily sharing the pieces of himself, but beginning to share the pieces of himself that are connected to others, because he feels that responsibility. He takes it very seriously. Your co-star, uh, her first name again is? Valicia. What is it that Barry Cordy calls her? He calls her black. <laughs> <laughs> He did he, did he call Diana Ross that? That's what he. That's what he and Diana Ross called each other. That was that was their word of love for each other. Because um, Barry has this thing where he says, "Look, it's it's not what people say; it's what they mean." You know, he says language is 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 language is different for different people. And we even have a scene in the show where we talk about it. Because there was a time in America when when black people didn't like being called black; it was seen as a negative and derogatory thing. And he said to her, "He's like, you know, it's all about semantics." He's like, "From now on, I'm going to call you black." We're gonna give it a meaning of love. Mm. So he would say, "Hey, Black, how are you? Oh, I'm good, Black." That so that was their their word of love for each other, a term of endearment. And uh, and when, you know, for me studying to become Barry, I did a lot of reading, but also a lot of it came just from spending time with him and watching him interact with Valicia, because she so embodies um, Diana Ross that sometimes even he forgets. And he starts to talk to her as if she's Diana. And, you know, wow. also she has so much information about Diana and their history that when they'll talk, she'll, she'll say, well, we'll know in 1972 <laughs> when we moved to L.A. So it's like, he'll be like, no, no, you remember, you did X, Y, and Z. And, she, so, and they start wow. to talk like that. And so I would just watch the two of them sometimes. By the way, you went to Hitsville, USA, right? Yes, yes. Right? You went to that place in Detroit. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to America? I mean, I, I, it, it's really hard to to really put together the words to encompass all that Motown means to America. Motown transformed not just uh, the music industry and the entertainment industry as a whole, but one thing I don't think people talk about enough um, and give Barry Gordy enough credit for is his role in the civil rights movement. I mean, he's really um, largely responsible for the transformation in thinking that we have as a society about the differences with each other. You know, Barry said, and he, he did a lot of work with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was actually a Motown artist. He was signed to a contract at Motown because Barry recorded all of his he did speeches. His, right, he did his speeches, and they were part of Motown's Catalog. Label. Yeah, right. they were part of the Motown label. He had Martin Luther King under contract, and you know he wanted to get those speeches out to people who couldn't see Martin and hear him live, so that people would would understand the, what the movement was about and what Martin was talking about, because he believed in it. And he said they would have conversations, because Martin came to him and he said, you, your music is what our whole philosophy is about. You know, And people begin to connect through emotion before they begin to connect politically. They connect through the music before. And what he did was, with the records, he wouldn't put the faces of the artists on the records. Right. He just put the music out there. And once people began to love the music, then he put the faces of the artists on the music so that people would identify what they loved with, with something that they were unfamiliar with. He put images of African Americans in the households of people around the world that were different from any images they had seen that had been really popularized in mainstream media before that, and really just transformed our, our entire culture. And he, 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 people don't talk enough about what he did for the movement. Brandon Victor Dixon plays uh, Barry Gordy in uh, Motown the Musical, playing at? At the Lundfontein Theater on 46th and Broadway. Well, we encourage everyone to go out there to see it. I know I'm looking forward to Please do. Uh, we look it. forward to having you. Well, uh, we wish you nothing but success and the best to you and your cast and uh, a piece of America that everyone needs to uh, appreciate on the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Right. Appreciate it. We'll be back from our Tisch WNET studios here at Lincoln Center right after this.
If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Big time basketball players been in Rolling Stone magazine, Sports Illustrated, NBA, Boston Celtics, Denver Nuggets. And I'm on a street corner hawking jewelry. I've had four overdoses. I have seven felonies on my record that I... The only thing I remember is glass hitting me and a police officer grabbing me. They found me two miles away, overdosed in my vehicle, crashed on the side of the road. When I came through, I was in handcuffs, in the back of an ambulance, on my way to the hospital, and then on my way to jail. He said, homeboy, you've been dead for 30 seconds. Powerful stuff. You're looking at Chris Heron, author of Basketball Junkie, founder of Hoop, uh, founder of Hoop Dreams with uh, Chris Heron. Good to see you, Chris. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Uh, powerful story. We were just talking before uh, off the air. That was a clip from ESPN documentary. Unguarded. Unguarded. Um, thumbnail sketch of your story. You're a great basketball player playing high school ball where? Fall River, Massachusetts. Grew up in Massachusetts, and uh, that's where I played high school and eventually went on to college. My basketball town, right? Champion, title town. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you were, you were to, I was going to say you were, to, we can't say that word on PBS, but you were it. Yeah, yeah, I was it. I was you got it recruited. Big time. I'm McDonald's All-American, top 10 in the country, you know, every school recruiting. Yeah. You know, I had all, all doors were open. Yeah, you go to play where? Boston College. Yeah. So you go to play Boston College, and how did things work out? <sighs> Not well. I, I was introduced to cocaine at 18. Um, said I'd do it once at a party in my room, and uh, 14 years later, you know. The spiral was out of control, but you also went out and you continued to play some college ball after that, mm. play for Jerry Tarkanian. Yeah. Talk about that. I moved 3,000 miles cross country to kind of get away. Um, the addiction came with me. Spent three years in Fresno. Did well on the court, not so well off the court, and, um, but well enough to where I'd get drafted, you know. Um, how did you get to the Celtics? I played my rookie season in Denver, and uh, I got a phone call from Rick Pitino saying, we just made a trade for you. You know, welcome home. Come back. So You're a six-foot-three guard. Yep. And you're, basic, you, 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 you're a good point guard. Mm -hmm. Handle the ball well. Mm -hmm. Get the ball to other people. You could shoot. Uh, smart vision for the game, right? Mm -hmm. um, people knew you could play, but they also knew you had this problem. Sure. Well documented. Mm -hmm. What's it like when you step onto the court up in uh, Celtic land. To be honest with you, I don't even, I don't have much recollection of it because I was under the influence of, of you know, 1,600 milligrams of Oxycontin on a daily basis. So those memories for me, I cherish being a Celtic today. I'm grateful for it. Um, nobody can take that away. Um, but when I was a Celtic, I had no, no feelings towards it. You know, I say, you know, I did the press conference, I held my jersey, I smiled, I said I couldn't wait for the opportunity, I could care less about the opportunity. I could care less about it. All I could care about was getting high. Um, do you believe you're one of those people who were, um, your genetic makeup, whatever you want to describe it, that you were destined, if you were going to do it once, you were going to be a junkie? Yes. I believe that you're genetically predisposed to, to the gene of addiction. Um, you know, it's, it's in my family, yeah. um, as it's in most uh, today. And, um, you know, I, I knew right away at 18 years old when I did it once that I was off. We got another clip from Unguard at the ESPN documentary. By the way, folks, you can log on to ESPN. Can people find it? Yeah, sure. People can find it on Amazon and I'm yeah. sure ESPN.com. Let's go to the clip. And at the time, there was times when I would come into the arena playing against Texas or UMass, you know, 12 o'clock noon, and I'd be in a car with two girls that I had no idea their names and I hadn't slept yet, and I'm doing my last line of cocaine as I'm walking into the arena. And, and I hadn't ate anything, I haven't done anything, and the last thing I drank was a Budweiser. My junior season, UMass was coming back for revenge at Fresno. I was out the whole night before. And it was like a four o'clock game. He called me at like, he called me at like 7.30 in the morning. And I know it was high as a kite. And I'm like, you got a 
fucking game on national television, man, against UMass. Down in the front court, working against Mack. Takes it inside, Smith. And uh, he played great. had a sensational game, and our arena was rocking. Our fans were really into it. Big victory here for the Bulldogs tonight over UMass, and a personal win for Chris Harris. And that happened on, like, on a Saturday night. And Monday afternoon, we were in the office, and our compliance guy came up and told me, Chris tested positive. Chris, I got to tell you, um, our producer, Natalie Stanley, who, who produced this segment, was watching the film. She kept saying, you got to watch this. you got to watch this. And you, we've got to show that segment. Uh, she was blown away by it. I'm sure it's impacting a lot of people right now. But the question becomes, for you who have seen this countless times, who, who and what the heck do you see when you're looking at that? Uh, it's tough to see. It's tough to watch. Do you recognize that as you? Of course I do. I will never, I will never look away from that person. You know, I'll never turn my back on that because if I do, I'll forget. So I know who he is. Um, you know, I just choose differently today. You know, one day at a time. But, but real quick, by the way, you've been sober for how long? Almost four years. Okay. <sighs> this all this right as we do this program. Um, but the, the, the really positive part about this. Um, Incredible story of mm -hmm. yours is you, you, you've, you're doing a lot of work to try to turn things around. Describe the, uh, the work you're doing, the organization. Sure. You know, well, I started a nonprofit, The Heron Project. The Heron Project. Yeah, because Chris Mullen saved me. Chris Mullen and his wife reached out to me and made the phone call. Chris to... Mullen from right here in St. John's? Right? Absolutely. The Mullen family reached out to me after they saw this on ESPN when I had overdosed almost four years ago and said, we're in a position to help you um, take our offer. Go. Overdose when they found you in the car? Yes, yes. So they called me in the hospital and said, we have a place for you in New York. We want you to go called Daytop. Jumped in the car and I went. If it wasn't for Chris Mullen and his wife picking up the phone that day, I probably wouldn't be here. So the Heron Project is started, was started for addicts who hit bottom, out of money, no insurance, we'll pay for them to go away. Why'd you do that? Why, because Why I- Why do you do that? Because I know what it's like to be at the bottom with nothing, you know, and, and I know what the healthcare system does. I mean, in Massachusetts, two people die a day of an overdose. The average length of stay in a treatment center for an opiate abuser is four days. Something's wrong there. To me, that's inhumane. I walked into a hospital, found overdosed in a vehicle, they discharged me 15 minutes later. Really? There's something wrong there. So, I believe in this. I believe treatment can save, a, save your life. And, and I want to be Chris Mullen. I want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that can look from afar and say, I connected that family. I had a piece of it, a mm. small piece. You know, just that first step. What's Project Purple? I spoke at a high school. Six little kids walked in the front row, introduced themselves as the sober students of the school. They had purple shirts on. <laughs> it blew my mind because the whole crowd laughed at them, 1,800 kids. Is that Project Purple right there? That is one, yes. That's one, one school. We had 300 schools go purple this What's year. What's it all about? It's just about kids making good choices, and not only the kids that make good choices, the kids who want to make good choices, and the kids that want to be forthcoming about their problems, making this okay to talk about it. And... Uh, you know, I experience this every day, traveling around the country speaking. Um, it's powerful stuff. It's pow these kids, they got, their, they, got, they got their backs up against the wall, you know, and nowadays it's not easy to be a kid. You have, uh, you have kids of your own. Mm hmm How much do you, uh, what's your relationship like with them now? It's beautiful. The greatest gift of my recovery is um, watching them recover. Watching yeah. them recover, recover from what? from this illness, from this disease. My son walked around at 
12 years old, 11 years old, 10 years old on eggshells. Just was waiting for the shoe to drop. Today he walks around with some pep in his step. You watched, uh, Natalie just reminded me in my ear that, that you watched this documentary Unguarded on ESPN with your son. Mm. Your son, Chris? Yes, Christopher. Uh, how old was he? He was 12. He had just turned, he was getting ready to turn 13. And um, I had this DVD in my back pocket for about two weeks and I was dreading <laughs> it, you know? I was like, ah, oh, man. I can't imagine this. Yeah. So I grabbed Samantha, who's 10, and I grabbed Christopher and I say, come on, I'm gonna go watch something. Your son and your daughter. We sit on the couch and the laptop's on me. The opening scene of this, this documentary is me catching alley-oops and, yep. you know, and I'm like, perfect, this is great, highlights, <laughs> you know? And then this woman says, former Celtic, found overdosed, in a drive through Dunkin' Donuts. It's a newscast. Yeah, a newscast. And Christopher starts just bawling. So I'm like, oh man, this is not gonna be easy, you know? So we cried, we cried, we laughed, we watched highlights, and uh, by the end of it, it was a uh, healing, healing moment because he looked at me and said, he said, uh, I knew all this, I'm just happy it's not Dan Noble. Yeah. Listen, uh, you know, you're, you're um, first of all, congratulations. Yeah, on, no doubt. On uh, your sobriety, your family, your work, and uh, the work that you're going to continue to do helping other people. And uh, I know you helped a lot of people come in here. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, brother. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. Funding has been provided by Barnabas Health, Berkeley College, the law firm of Gibbons PC, United Water, Wells Fargo, Verizon Communications, and by New Jersey Natural Gas. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by the Adler Aphasia Center. Hi, I'm Governor Tom Kane. A dear friend of mine had aphasia, which is a language disorder that occurs from a brain injury or a stroke. It robs a person's ability to communicate, but it doesn't affect their intellect. Programs and services offered at the Adler Aphasia Center help to improve my friend's communication skills, as well as her self-confidence and quality of life. Most importantly, she was among people who understood her. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with aphasia, there is hope.